Today I'm going to have a conversation with an author friend of mine, Lauren Barnett. Lauren confessed to me that uh, as a recent resident of London, she doesn't know much about UK crime. And I said, that's okay. I didn't really want to talk about true crime today. I want to talk about film. This is Who Killed Teresa. My guest today is Lauren Barnett. She is the author of the forthcoming Death Lines, Walking London Through Horror Cinema. She also hosts her own podcast, London Horror Movie Club. Lauren, welcome so much to the Thank podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, John. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see you. Um, Listeners don't know, but I can actually see Lauren. Lauren can see me. So it's great to see you and, and to have this opportunity to spend some time uh, talking about, about your work, about your upcoming book. I have a ton of questions, but I'd, maybe the, the best place to start is as an introduction to, to listeners. And by the way, I have, I, I have a small enclave of UK listeners. So ah. Feel free to uh, to promote your your book. Can can you talk a little bit about what you know your background and what brought you to writing um, writing Deathlines? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very weird, windy road. I I was doing my PhD back in the day, um, back towards 2017, and it was actually on the way people visualize the dead. So it was largely photography. But that crossed over quite a lot with weirdly fashion and also film. And I got sidetracked, interested in it. I don't know if anyone else out there has done a PhD, but you sort of get sick of your own topic. And so you end up pursuing other sort of more interesting things. And I got more and more into horror films. I'd always watched some as a kid and like I loved Hitchcock growing up. But I got really interested in, in the way we sort of look at horror films and then Having moved to London for my PhD, I had this little bit of excitement at seeing films where I knew where they were filmed. It's, it's maybe coming from a sort of relatively small town. I grew up in, in Chapel Hill that it was exciting to see somewhere that you actually lived on cinema. And so I got really interested in it and finished my PhD and was trying to find walks I could go on that were about these, these places and no one was doing them. I couldn't believe it. The only walk I could find was a Hitchcock walk and it only talked about a couple of his horror movies. And so I was like, oh, well I should, and actually my, my husband at, at the time, my boyfriend right, was said, why don't you try one? You, you used to you know, act in high school, this might work for you. It's a fun thing to do while you're looking for a job after your PhD. So I did some walks and they were really popular. And somebody, uh, Mark at Strange Attractor Press said, you know, People would do this as a book. We've done other London Walks books. And so I just got very lucky, really. And it turned into this book, which was the tough thing was actually narrowing it down. I, I didn't realize how few books you need in order for a book to be, you know, walkable, small enough to carry around with you. It's only only eight. And I ended up putting in little one off places because I was so heartbroken and have to limit it down so much. Well, I noticed that in the chapter you sent me on, on Chelsea. There's sort of at the end, there's a sort of like, well, if you like that, I want to you know, <laughs> yeah. these things. Did you go to Chapel Hill High? I cannot remember. Oh, no, I went to, to Durham Academy. My brother went to Chapel Hill. OK, OK, very good. And uh, so I've only read the one chapter, which which I, I love. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? chapter on Chelsea? Yeah, I, I'm really thrilled that was the one we got to send you because it's it's one of my favorite walks. So Chelsea is an area of London. I don't, I don't know if you've had a chance to go. It's not on the usual tourist track, but it's really now. Not, very not only have I not been to Chelsea, I've never been actually to London. Oh. And it doesn't matter because like anyone who loves cinema, you sort of, and it, I'll let you finish here, you, you become really <laughs> invested in the places you talk about because oh, I great. so because I know some of them so 
Oh, wonderful. I, yes, when you do come though, I'll take you on a walk, I promise. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so Chelsea's a, an area that's now really affluent. You show up and it's a bunch of really nice shops that you'd be sort of intimidated to go in and buy anything at. But in the 1960s, it was this really transitional place. The King's Road was even in like music videos and you have people like Jimi Hendrix here. And so it had quite a bubbling. I mean, Mary Quant had a, a place on the King's Road. So it had this really bubbling culture, but it was crashing with this long tradition, as you can imagine it being called the King's Road of slightly posher area pre-war. And so this strange mix of the, the sort of old classic, almost Victorian line British brace belts and this very new flower child swinging 60s feel created a lot of real social tension. And that's what the films got really into. And so the walks follow all eight films that were done in Chelsea. They all happen between 67 and 76. So they're all really charged with this emotion. I think some of the, some of the best sort of stories and writers and horror movies come out of that time period I'm waiting for a new new one of those if you know what I mean yeah um, but yes, yeah, sorry, I, I've, I've been droning on, but basically the, the walks go through the area and talk a lot about that and how the film filmmakers were responding to that and I think I think a lot of people would know Chelsea from 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 films like uh, with Noel and I oh, okay. um, or or um, trying to think of it of another one. Well, certainly you mentioned Clockwork Orange. I had no idea that the record store that Alec goes into is now a McDonald's. Yeah, <laughs> it's depressing a little, isn't it? But it, it's so great in the film because they actually were inside the Chelsea drugstore. So that's what it looked like at the time. It wasn't dressed up for the film. And so that neon interior was actually what you could have seen. That's now a very white beige McDonald's. Which is, I mean, who knew, you know, we're where, where Heaven 17 got their name and would become Heaven 17 five years later after, after splitting from, um, who did they split from? The Human League. And there it is, and there it is um, in, uh, in Clockwork Orange. But you mentioned some others here. I'll, I'll get to Deathline, because I, I want to hear yeah. about it. But, but I mean, <clears throat> Uh, the Sorcerers with Boris uh, Karloff. I actually watched it the other night, and it's great. And it's just, you know, it, there's for a number of reasons. It's so great to see sort of that decrepit Chelsea. You know, he goes into like an apothecary or some, and it's just seedy looking. And and it's great to see Karloff. I mean, we don't get to see him in the latter half of his career, and and here he is in a starring role. And it's got all that 60s music and go-go clubs and I yeah. just love it. I think that's one of the, the best. I'm amazed. So Mike Reeves did Witchfinder General and everyone knows him for that. I'm amazed this isn't the film they know him for because you're right. It's got so much character. It's like real London. It feels gritty. And, and I loved that Boris Karloff, part of the reason he was able to do it, he, he has lower mobility in the later part of his life. And you can see that in the film, but he lived nearby. So that made it very sort of convenient. It's actually his streets. It, it, you talk a lot about, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, the Hammer films and like Dracula AD, which I... I <laughs> Oh, it's it's a weird about, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <a> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for anybody who hasn't seen it, and if you haven't, I'm I'm not totally surprised it wasn't popular at the box office. But it's it's the traditional sort of what you think of as Dracula. It's Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. But what they've done is they've plumped them in Chelsea. So at the start of the film, they have these young, you know, cool people. They're at a, like a house party, and then they go to a coffee shop. They're very. It's a very old person's vision of what that was. So it's a bit cliche but you have these young people and they decide they're going to raise Dracula from the dead because they're bored and the head guy who does this is Johnny Alucard which is Dracula backwards and I think that tells you how sort of deep the film really gets but it's very entertaining and then you you have him sort of raised up and Dracula's stuck he can't leave the church ground for some reason and so Alucard's the one who like goes out and he seduces all these women and he goes to club and he's a very sort of chic vampire but at the heart of the film is this really weird hammer story of the old versus the new because hammer at that point of course it had been wildly famous in the 50s but it was in real decline it wasn't keeping up with psychological horror and things like that and so you have 
the main characters, this really young 30 something bad guy fighting, bless him, I love him to pieces, a very elderly Peter Cushing in the latter part of his career. And the scene where the two of them fight is just hilarious because you're like, there's just no way Alucard could trip on him and break all of the bones in his body. And he ends up winning. And I always think he does it in the most pensioner way. He pushes him into a shower and turns the shower on and Dracula can't be under running water. And so he de death by shower. Hour. So he's like the most <laughs> low impact vampire death you can have. But at the heart of that really is this idea that, that it's the older generation that's saving everyone. The young kids are the ones who cause the problems. The young Dracula is the Alucard, is the one who's doing all this evil. And it's Peter Cushing in his Victorian gentlemanly dress and his old fashioned ways that save things. And it feels a bit like Hammer Studios is saying, no, us gothic old guys are where the future is. Don't, don't, be, don't be fooled into this young new exciting psycho and peeping tom it's us who have have the answers well that that's you don't talk about those films but i'm a big fan of michael powell's peeping oh, tom yeah. and then and i think it came later the collector yeah um, both of those films are just for me like just i mean a lot of people don't know them i i remember i was actually on a podcast somebody's horror podcast a couple of years ago where he said, do you want to discuss a film? And I said, yeah, I want to discuss The Collector. And we got 10 minutes in and, and realized I was talking about the 60s British film and he was talking about some recent horror oh. American one. <laughs> I don't even know the American one. <laughs> Yeah, what it was. So, but I'm um, amazed. I love peeping. It's peeping toms in one of the other walks that go up to you know. Do you remember that opening shot where you see the woman being followed in the camera hairs and they walk up to her and then you see that she dies but you don't totally see how. Yeah, that location is up by Bloomsbury. It's in one of my other walks. Another film. Speaking of like horror villains of an age. I mean, I, I think most people know. Peter Cushing, probably from Star Wars of a younger generation. Would know. Oh, yeah. Um, you, you talk about theater of blood. Do you want to, and, and <laughs> relation to Chelsea, do you want to tell us yeah. who and, and how it, so Theater of Blood has the, the horror ham master, Vincent Price, who I just love. <laughs> and this is, if you like Vincent Price and his goofy stuff, this is him at his hammiest. I think it's one of his, his just, he goes for it in the best possible way. And fundamentally, it is all over London. And it's really a story of revenge. He plays this, this actor who a bunch of critics have basically panned. And as a result, he, he, commit suicide because he's so devastated by their horrible critique of him and he's actually talented so there is a reason that he should be so upset they've sort of got it out for him but he ends up surviving the leap into the Thames and he gets revenge by basically killing them in the way and a big sorry uh the Shakespeare play that he was sort of critiqued that particular this is hard to explain so the critics have all watched him in these Shakespearean plays and whichever play they get the bad review of he kills them in a way that's in that play I hope that has made sense <laughs> it, does. it would be sort of I don't think this happens but it would be great if it, w it would if somebody gave a bad review of the Scottish play then he's literally going to have Burnham Wood come and kill them Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's that. And there's some amazing ones. The two in Chelsea are great fun and they're very visual. You've got um, uh, the one critic, Larding, is killed when he goes into a wine shop. And there's this, this actually really cute news house in real life is turned into this wine shop. And they then take him down underground. And this was this part was shot at the tower, the old sort of Tower of London experience, so an old museum. And they drown him in a vat of wine, just like in Richard III. And then you have another one who um, he gets a call and he's told that his, his wife's cheating on him. And he shows up outside. It's this beautiful brick house that's right off the Thames on the Chelsea embankment. And he sees Vincent Price all like dressed up, cool 70s, all white gear going into the house. And he like blows a kiss at the window. And then he hears these groans and moans. And he, he's so jealous. He runs upstairs and he smothers her with a pillow. But we know she's been having a massage. So she's so it's Othello. She's totally innocent. And he's just been brought to that point. It, it's not in the Chelsea walk, but one of the great ones as well that's in a different location is I, I can never remember the Shakespearean play's name, which is awful. So hopefully you can help me. But somebody is forced to eat their own children. 
Oh, it's got to be Titus Andronicus. Yes, Titus Andronicus. Thank you. It's terrible, isn't it? Some names stick, some don't. Um, but there's like one 30, in the film. 40 plays to keep in your head. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you were able to, though. Thank God. <laughs> um, but it's great. In the film, what they do is this guy is he's deeply in love with his little miniature poodles and they bake the miniature poodles into a pie. <laughs> So great. And of course, the supporting characters in all of these films are just, you know, I don't know their names, but you recognize them from hundreds of, of, of British films from the, the same era. I wanted to ask you this question. I think before I even planned to do this, I was going to ask, I was going to, I was going to ask you this anyway, because I'm toying with the idea. I'm, I'm like, I'm working on a manuscript right now. And and I'm toying with, and you know what it is because we've talked about it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and I've I've been trying to, to to insert elements of cinema into it. Oh. And I and, and I don't know why, but I sort of know why. But you're gonna have a more intelligent answer. <laughs> what is it about cinema that not only reflects on culture but informs culture and and i don't mean in a sort of like they watched a movie and then they did this sort of like taxi driver to john hinckley Mm. but but in a more indirect psychological effect what is it about film and place that has such an effect on our lives i know you've got an answer for this Mm. or somebody (laughs) I mean, I think, honestly, that that's one of those great life existential questions that you could sit around with a bottle of wine and talk about for hours and hours. But I do think fundamentally, at least part of it is that, and certainly for for quite a lot of us, it's now maybe becoming more streaming, but it, it's such a big part of your lives. I, you know, when, when I was little, you, you went to the movies and it was, it was the thing that you, you experienced new emotions and new experiences for the first time. Like maybe the first time you had your big crush was on screen. Maybe the first time you were really, truly scared was on screen. And so you have this really strong emotional connection and in your life, I don't know about you, but I have, you know, lines from movies or scenes from movies that, that stayed with me as part of my character, as part of who I've become and the decisions I make in life. And I think film more so than anything else, I mean, actual people, but more so than any other kind of manufactured thing has a way of touching us in all of these really deep ways because we, we see it, we experience it, we see these people going through it. And so we can connect to it in this really real and immediate way. Yeah, I mean, all of what you're saying is, is absolutely true. I remember the girl I was on the date with when I saw Annie Hall. Yeah. Watching them fall in love and you're falling in love at the same time. I, I will never forget being in Halifax, Nova Scotia and going to see Alien in 1979 oh. and not having any idea what it, what it was about. I was just dragged to it. Let's go see this movie. And of course, <laughs> you're it's, a change. Yeah, it's so funny you say that. I, uh, Alien was a movie I watched. I was, I was at university and I'd gone through a sort of period of time where I wasn't watching horror movies. And it was the first horror movie I'd seen in a while because we had it for class. And I watched it and I was like, it blew my mind. I had to watch it a second time and it was late going back to the library because of how much I loved it. And it's funny how movies can, I'll remember forever sitting on the floor of my little dorm being like, oh my God. I was, um, you know, part of the reason I bring it up is in in the, the book I'm writing, Grand Central Station in New York City is a focal point. It's a piece of architecture is a set piece. Um, and I was trying to imagine what it looked like in, in the 60s, because it would have been a very, very different experience. And, and, you know, you can look at photographs, you can look at this, but I, I, I asked some friends for film set in New York in the 60s. And one of the films <clears throat> they brought my attention to is a John Frankenheimer film called Seconds. Frank, Frank, yeah, Frankenheimer is mostly known for like films like The Manchurian Candidate. But Seconds opens, uh, it's phenomenal. It, it's, it's set in the late 60s and it opens with a man in Grand Central Station and it literally tracks him, you know, through the Grand Hall, down to the tracks, onto the train, in the train, and then getting off at either Scarsdale or New Rochelle. I mean, it, it was exactly, 
it was exactly the trajectory that I needed to see from the 60s. And you know, so I, I know it's that element I find of film that is just fascinating. That's and amazing. timeless, it's, it's, it's there for you. It, yeah, it, it, that's a good point. There's sort of archives of, of our world in some ways, because you can, you can dip into literally the architecture, but also then the way he filmed it will tell you something about the era and the way people are dressed. And God, that's so cool. It sounds amazing. I need to watch it. Yeah, it is. And it, it stars Rock Hudson. It kind of flopped because Hudson, you know, was known for pillow talk and these romantic comedies. And, and here he ends up doing a very dark science fiction horror film. Um, so he has sort of Ivar Novello story when he did The Lodger. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk about The Lodger? My, oh, sure. My <laughs> favorite Hitchcock film. Well, oh, no, it's, it's not my favorite, but it's of the ones less known, it's probably the one I, I gravitate to. If anyone hasn't seen it, I highly recommend it. Even just for that, that scene where they shoot in the glass below where he's doing the pacing, that's an amazing scene. So if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing it for that scene alone. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, as, as with this Rock Hudson thing, Ivor Novello had been known as a sort of hot, hot throb romantic lead. And he was cast as this very um, sort of sketchy as maybe what we would call now eerie seeming character. And he is, he is the titular lodger that shows up and it's, basically him coming out of the middle of the night in the fog to this house that has a room for rent in the roof. And he asks for it. He makes very little demands. He says he'll pay well, so they let him. But as he goes along, they notice that every time there's a, a sort of murder that's happening elsewhere, then you have him gone in that evening. And so they start to wonder if he's this, this famous killer that they have for it. And it's based, as you can imagine, on, on a book that's inspired by Jack the Ripper. So it's Ripper style murders that he seems to be disappearing for. I don't want to give away the ending, but it causes a lot of great tension, of course, because it's Hitchcock. He does it in this really tense, almost claustrophobic way. It's insane how, how much atmosphere he's able to pull yeah. you know, from... See, I mean, it's silent, right? It's a silent film. Yeah. Um, uh, but you don't, I mean, you, I mean, I've seen it with, I'm trying to, I've seen it with various soundtracks. It doesn't matter. It's he, his cinematography is the star. Yeah. yeah. No. And I, I think if anything, it must be a really fun, if you're the kind of person who does the, the music for those, it must be a fun movie to do that for because there's so many ups and downs there's a lot of moments there's even moments of sweetness there must be so much for the people who do put together the soundtracks for that to try and follow because you get lost in the film you really do yeah death lines <laughs> so i saw it it's I, obviously I, I love it i i so loved it i like it stayed with me um, that kind of ooze and gore thing is normally not my thing, but it, so I'll let you elaborate, but some of the things you talk about death lines in, in this chapter on Chelsea and, and why you chose that as, as the title of the book, but some things that struck me about it is, is, um, its influence on a film like American Werewolf in, in London was yeah. the first thing that struck me. You're, you're right, Donald Pleasance is phenomenal. He's, he's not only grumpy, he's delightfully playful. Yeah. And, and, I, and I don't think he would have ended up in John Carpenter's Halloween had he not made this film. But um, it's, it's a star performance. There's, there's so much in it. The, the director went on to make Poltergeist 3, which I didn't know, and on and on and on. <laughs> but do you want to do you want to talk about why it's your favorite movie? Yeah, um, I mean, I the first time I saw Death Lines, I, I didn't know Gary Sherman, the director at the time. I saw it, I think, just randomly on one of those late night movie shows, and it's not, I don't think, super well known. So I had no idea what to expect going into it. And and like you said, even from the start, it's not quite what you expect that kind of movie to be. And I think that's why I fell in love with it. You know, you start off with this. It's very atmospheric from the start. You have this you're following this guy with a bowler hat through Soho and then down to the underground. And then he gets attacked by something and you don't you don't see what. And that in and of itself, it starts you off really well. And you think the movie is going to be entirely this okay monster on the underground movie. You think you're prepared for it. 
but then it ends up going so deeply into all these different social things, all these little bits of, of British culture, of British society. I mean, for example, the guy who gets killed, he's constantly referred to by his OBE. And it's this kind of weird joke throughout, but it also ends up meaning that his name's Manfred. And it means that you compare him with the, the male cannibal character who's only known as Man. You end up sort of comparing the two and they become this complete contrast because obviously on the one hand, totally different worlds, guy living above ground, guy living underground, very wealthy affluence, somebody who's literally scrounging for, for food on the underground and people specifically as food. But then you go into Manfred's house through the detective, um, Detective Calhoun, who's Donald Pleasant, ends up going to his house to investigate. And he gets, there, there's actually a great cameo from Christopher Lee where he gets warned off there. Great I read, cameo. I read somewhere that, that, that Brando was originally asked to do that role. Wow. And I, I don't believe it. <laughs> I get it. Christopher Lee is too perfect. You can't have Brando. <laughs> you need very uptight British. You need this like really refined man. He's menacing as well. It's really yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, that smile and all. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so you have this scene when this happens and, and Detective Cal Calhoun discovers inside, there's like a hidden room where this guy is filming people and it, it has very Epstein moments for us nowadays, but even at the time, it's really creepy. And all of a sudden, the victim becomes this creep and you're not sure how you feel. Like on the one hand, it's awful that he was eaten alive, but then there's also a bit of he kind of deserved it. How different is he? He's sort of consuming these people in a different way, but he's kind of a cannibal. And I just love all the different layers to that in every character in the film. That, that hidden room is extraordinary because they don't, what they show you, and I don't know how you do this. I think there's like an Art Deco statue in the room. Mm -hmm. There's a television monitor. And yet it's all that's needed to suggest that this is really not a good thing yeah and it's it's in that red cast as well and it just it feels icky and gross you want it you want the camera to get out of there yeah yeah, yeah. one of the I, things I love I don't know if you noticed this but they they pan into that room the same way they pan into showing you man's cave in the underground and I think there's an element of that to it too you sort of you both of them you're in the same position visually and it's it's creepy well I was going to mention that that the lair establishing shot in the, which I think is 720 degrees that they, they go around. Yeah, they go around it twice. Yeah. Once close and then one far away. Uh, and the soundtrack is just a dripping. It's just a dripping <laughs> film. It's incredible. It's Oh, it's amazing. It, I, I feel like it's incredible that a director can, in just a few seconds, make you feel like you're, you're there and you've gotten so uncomfortable you need to leave. It's so, so many things about that film, they do that. It's, he's so atmospheric and he's so, he keeps you very much at the edge. So you're uncomfortable the whole time, even in like comic moments, the, the one that I talk about in there where, where Calhoun's making fun of the, the boy. It's so uncomfortable because you, you, you're mad at him and the situation's socially awkward and you're just, the whole time, you're just at the edge for one reason or another. It's brilliant. Well, it's, it's a bit, like Donald Pleasance goes too far. Yes. It makes it uncomfortable, which makes it <laughs> fantastic. Like, like, you know, all that stuff with the kid about why don't you go see a lecture, get a haircut. Cut your hair. <laughs> yeah, cut, your, cut that hair. It's it great. And the, and the guy, he's an American actor who never, I don't think, went on to anything else. He's not, he's not particularly good, but that makes it even better. Yeah, I think so much of it felt like it, it felt like it was sort of raw, it almost found footagey because these people seem normal. I mean, it's not shot that way, but it feels like normal students. I think he and Patricia are very believable, just normal students, mm -hmm. normal goofing around. And then that Trick makes it more that, unsettling. That sort of feathered quaff. She looks like, you know, <laughs> Brian Conley from the <laughs> the sweet or something, you know, or, or it's... It's yeah, the fashion in it, the um, all of the tube um, location shots. I mean, it's so gritty. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they did such a good job. I think as well. So you have the like the the normal tube, which in and of itself is sort of claustrophobic, but it's kind of clean and sterile. And then you go back into the the 
disused British Museum station and it feels like a cave almost. Like you say, there's dripping and you can feel the water coming off of the walls and muddy and dirty. And weirdly, there's a dirtiness to the other underground, but they're so different. How did you discover that film? Um, like you said, Bax and I watched it one night um, on like a late night thing. Um, I think it was in college. So it was before I'd even done this book. And basically what happens when I started doing the, the sort of walks and stuff, I was like, oh, I know what I need to do for this book. I should have an underground tour where instead of walking, you're hopping through the underground. So I have one of those. And it was in totally because I just loved this film. And I was like, I'm sure there must be others. I thought American Werewolf. And then, of course, I found others like Creep and things like that in 28 weeks later. But it was because of Deathlines. I was like, oh, I have to do the underground because it is such a cool and interesting and weird place. You, do you do this a lot in London? Go on walks and just discover? Yeah, I mean, it's especially, I, I'm sure, you know, when you're writing, you feel like you need to get out of the house. And it's great city for that because you can, you can take a bus somewhere that you're not sure where it is and you can walk and you'll find out where you are or, you know, you can take a tube. It's really nice city to walk through. And it's a great city to get lost in because you're never really lost nowadays with Google Maps. So you can stumble across some amazing pub or some beautiful or weird alley and you can find your way home and it's fine. Woke up, it was a Chelsea morning, and the first thing that I knew, there was milk and toast and honey, and a bowl of oranges too, and the sun poured in like butterscotch, and stuck to all my senses. Oh, won't you stay, we'll put on the day, and we'll talk in present tense. I noticed, not to get off topic too much, but I was, I was trolling you. It's <laughs> my job, but I noticed you wrote this paper on Michel Foucault. Oh yeah! Wow, nobody who reads is, that stuff. <laughs> no, who is one of my who is one of my favorite philosophers? I, I mean, I don't know that much about philosophy. I, I don't, but I know Foucault, and 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 you you wrote about his. I guess his book, The Birth of the Clinic. And mm -hmm. I was just, was this early on in your doing your PhD that you did this? Yeah. So basically uh, my PhD was looking at the ways we image the body. And so The Birth of the Clinic was a natural one because I looked at medical photographs and the way we relate to, uh, well, rather the way that clinicians and doctors relate to the body is really heavily tied to that. And so the, the bit that you read is actually part of my PhD that I, I published as a paper. So that was it. But yeah, I, I liked the, I really liked finding Foucault because he is all about power and power structures and the way those can be really insidious. And there's something really, I think, especially if you're somebody who, who grows up in a very conservative background environment, there's something really powerful and exciting about finding people who find power intimidating, but also creepy. So the book is called The Death Lines Walking London Through Horror Cinema. Any update on a release date? Um, so it should be mid-November here in the States. I think they're they're delaying in a bit, so it's February. If you're desperate to get one sooner, it, you can go through the publisher, Stranger Tractor Press is trying to get out anyone who does it straight through them. Um, but Amazon and stuff like that will have it in February in the States. And I imagine Canada, similar time frame. But here in Britain, it's mid-November. And so it's only a few weeks away, which is wild. Yeah. You excited? Obviously. I am. I am. I, I, it's really, really, it's one of those things where you don't feel like it's real, no matter how hard you've been working on it. So you have it in your hands. So I'm really excited to actually see it and hold it. And honestly, one of the most fun parts for me has been um, not just the part I did, but afterwards, because the maps are getting drawn by an illustrator. I got the chance to like see them through someone else's eyes, the illustrator drawing them up. And that was great fun because I got to see which sort of scenes she thought would be cool to have in the background and how she plotted the maps. They have these really eerie eyes at each of the spot that you were going to stop and see. And it's got a very sort of creepy vibe, even the illustration. So that that I think I was really excited about as well. Well, I think the writing is wonderfully dense in what I saw. 
in, in the best pot, wonderfully dense, it, because, because it's a travelogue, um, it's film history, but then you also pack so much in there about culture that is, it, it just sort of like, it's really impressive. Oh, thank you. And I think, like you said, you know, film, films end up being so much about culture and influencing culture. For me, I, 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 I do feel like I tried to shove a lot in, but I hope it's, I hope it's good and exciting because I think that's what excited me about them. Well, we will, uh, I will post links so that people know where to buy it and oh, all of that. You. Can, um, more broadly, what are, currently, what are some of your favorite films? Oh, wow. That's a huge question. Yeah, what is you can make it seasonal. It's Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Hitchcock taken in a totally different way. One of my favorite films when I was younger, and I still I still force my husband to watch it every now and then, is To Catch a Thief. I know it's not Hitchcock's greatest film or anything, but I loved that film from a young Love guy. it. Oh, good. I recently, um, I, I, was, I was in quarantine I guess two years ago when I went to Canada, I had to, oh. I had to, I had to stay locked up for two weeks in a, in a, like a, a like a hotel or a B and B is what it was. And there was a Hitchcock fest on the movie channel. And, oh, that, God. Was, <laughs> and that was one of the films. And, and I just, I well Cary Grant to begin with. Yeah. He's, amazing. I, he's an incredibly um, deceptively more talented than he appears to be um, mm. you know how he manages his way and maneuvers through that film I think is is really interesting and I I too I, I had Hitchcock down as I had some notes here because I I love Hitchcock too uh, yeah. and 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 the, you know his use of we're talking about plays set pieces the obvious one is Mount Rushmore Less obvious um, um, in the thirty nine cents, uh, thirty nine steps, the fourth bridge. Yeah, um, that great uh, shot of it when he needs to like sneak out of the train on the bridge. I just, I just love it. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah. So you, so you, so that's one of them to catch a thief. Other Hitchcock Definitely. favorites. Um, I mean, I, I I definitely have to make sure I say that all all Hitchcock movies are great. I, I they were probably my first inroad into this kind of movies. It was my dad's favorite, and I watched them with him every weekend and just loved it. Um, I uh, gosh, this is this is really hard. I really love Memento, but it's not the kind of film you can see more than once. But I really liked the idea, and I like the principle sort of behind it. This idea that can you really get over loss if you don't have the memory of the loss? That's such a cool idea to me. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of weirdly links into my PhD about you know grieving and picturing grieving and all of that good stuff. Um, but on, on a happier note, I must like happy movies. Let me try and think of a happy movie <laughs> that I enjoy. But, oh, I should say The Producers. It, technically it was a stage play, but I love that film. And my two cats are named Fiala, Stock and Bloom. I love The Producers. Oh, really? It's a great, it's so much. I mean, the music is obviously amazing. Mel Brooks is hilarious, but the cast is incredible. I mean, nobody can beat Nathan Lane for me. And that's amazing. Uma Thurman's incredible. Just everyone, even the small characters, amazing. Have you seen it? It looks like you have, yeah. Well, I've seen the original one with Zero Muscle. Oh, and I've not seen hilarious. the other one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you can't get over it. I, I have to say the, um, the Zero Mostel is totally, obviously nobody should try and play up to him and Nathan Lane doesn't try to, but I mean, he's no, just no, so don't... big and great. Yeah. They're, they're to my mind, from what I know about them, they, they can stand alone on their own merits and they don't yeah. have to compete with each other. No, yeah. they do. But yeah, no, the original, the 60s one is really good as well. It's so funny. And that that feels like the era. I love the 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 hips and that hippie Hitler, the high Hitler is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is kind of hippie Hitler. I, I'm yeah. thinking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to know your impressions about living in the United States versus li living in London. And was that much of an adjustment for you or... Um, what your perceptions around how it's different and all that having grown yeah. up in Chapel Hill yeah I mean it, it was 
it was a huge adjustment, but in a really positive way. Um, I, I think if this doesn't sound too corny, I think I really fell in love with London the way you do with the person. The more I got to know it, the more I fell in love with it. But at first, I, you know, co coming from Chapel Hill and we traveled and stuff, but I'd never lived really anywhere big. The university town that I lived in had, I think, something like 5,000 people in it. And then I went to London straight from that. And it was just so big and so overwhelming. And I found that very strange. And then, of course, you think being American and being very <laughs> arrogant as we are that everyone does things the American way, you think you'll have no problem. They speak my language. It's fine. And the way people interact, the culture is very different. People here are obviously it's very, very different social signals. So things like trying to end a conversation, they do it in a really different way. Trying to start a conversation, they do it in a really different way. And I absolutely sort of, I think, blindly, like a giant rhinoceros, bulled through most of my social experiences the first few years. But when you when you learn it, it's really nice. I actually, I, I find it really wonderful and really, I find the people here really kind of weirdly honest in a very different way america's got a really big like we're going to be very we'll say whatever we mean and even if it's awful and here there's a kind of sweetness to it they're very clear about how they feel and what they want and everyone likes and respects their space but it's done in a much softer way that i found really appealing i like it uh it definitely works for shire people um which is great and yeah but i think as well part of the thing that i loved about london is so much is here um, you, there's nothing wrong with Chapel Hill. It was absolutely lovely place to grow up. And, and, you know, we still had, we had great theater. We had good food. Like it wasn't, it wasn't in the middle of nothing, but there's so much in London that you're just never, you never have something that you can do a second time. That, sorry, I'm saying this really badly. There's always something new that you can do something totally different and exciting in London. Even if it's walking to a part of London, you haven't seen, even if it's trying a food that you've never seen going to a play, it's amazing. And I think that I have found the most exciting because you can, like, like you said, if you want to walk the city, that's great. If you decide yesterday, we're just like, you know, we haven't been to the theater in a while. What weird thing is on above a pub at seven today that we can get tickets for? And you go and see something that you definitely, you don't know anything about. And it's, you know, it, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but it's, it's so fun. There's so much joy to it. And I think that's what I really love about it. I imagine because you've lived in bigger cities. Is this true of all cities or am I just sort of pink London colored glasses? No, I, I think, you know, I've lived in Chapel Hill for like, what is it now? It, almost 25 years. Uh, but having lived in Los Angeles and in New York and Toronto and Montreal, um, I think the, the, what's most aligned with your, what you're describing in your experience, I was recently, as I, I was back in New York City last month and uh, had not been there uh, for a long time as, as an adult experience. I'd, I'd been with my kids, but that's, okay. a, that's a different kind of thing. Um, so to be there as an, as an adult and be able to, you know, the power of memory, remember when I was there as a, as a, a theater student, and that's what I really remembered was that every you, you know, it was a petri dish. It was a cultural peach, petri dish. Any any evening, you didn't know, you, you didn't need to plan it out. You just you just go out, and yeah. and it would reveal itself to you. You'd walk into a bar. Or, I mean, Forty Second Street was was a wonder then because it was pre -dis Disneyfication. Oh wow! So, so if you were in the business of people watching, which which an actor is, this was was incredible to have that opportunity to have a window into you know a subculture a deviant culture that normally you wouldn't you wouldn't have that I mean because it's so on display in the city of in New York where in other communities it's sort of hidden it's not really yeah. it's not so in your face so it was an incredible opportunity that was my experience on your notion of you can never do the same thing twice in London. I, I would challenge you on that because my eldest daughter, my children are now grown. My eldest daughter just came back from London. Uh, she, was, she was in Europe for most of the summer and she managed to go with, with all the th theatrical opportunity in front of you. She managed to see <laughs> the Phantom of the Opera twice. Well, she <laughs> 
No, that's true. I mean, of course, like museums you go back to multiple times. But I have the opera's an interesting. I mean, she must have loved it, which is great. <laughs> it, you know, it's closing soon, so it was a big deal yeah. for her. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, no, I should talk. I We go every Christmas to Book of Mormon. So evidently you can do it like six or seven times. <laughs> so um, after um, Deadlines, what, what's your next publishing venture? Ooh, uh, well, this obviously depends on the publishers, but I'm submitting a sci-fi novella around, a slightly horror-ish sci-fi novella around and seeing seeing what happens with that. Um, and I, I have been asked hopefully to do volume two of Deathlines, which is great. And um, the other thing that's on the docket that I'm doing just research for, so this is probably a few years down the road, is um, Scream Green. So it's about, uh, it's a guide to eco horror and all of the sort of plant-based horrors all the way back to like Carrot Man in the 50s through to Girl with All the Gifts today. Well, that, no, that sounds great. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. Um, I, ho- I hope you don't mind me asking this is- Slightly random, but I, I wanted to ask you since I have you and we're talking about horror films and you are an actor. Have you ever wanted to or acted in a horror movie? What's it like? <laughs> um, well, I, I've never been in like, I've never been in a horror movie. What I liked for a period there in the triangle, well, here in the triangle, uh, the Irish playwright Connor McPherson was really, really big. Oh. And uh, he's he's kind of a, a a contemporary ghost story playwright and his 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 plays are rich and you know they always have an ending that just shocks them I, i've been in multiple connor mcpherson plays where you, you know when the hook comes at the end audience members scream so oh, it's wow. yeah yeah to, to give you an idea what what his writing is like and you know they're intensely psychological and and storytelling based and and usually involved like something horrible happening to them. <laughs> yeah. so I've had the opportunity of doing a, a couple of Connor McPherson plays and I, so I think that's the closest to doing a horror and and I really loved it both times mm-hmm. that I did it yeah I imagine it's so different from the inside because it's really easy to sit back and be scared, but to create being scared for someone in an environment where they're fundamentally safe, you know, they're sitting in a lovely chair in a theater. That must be really, really challenging. Um, did you did you find it that way? Uh, sorry if I'm asking too many questions. I'm just curious. No, no, not at all. I mean, I no, I, I, I mean, it is a trick to it. I think I think the way you do it is, I mean, obviously, if, if the cast is tense and uptight and it's not going to work you've you've got the trick is you've got to be so relaxed and and so in control or or seemingly in control until the point you know that that you're supposed to be you know jolted out of your socks and and then they're jolted out of their socks so it's yeah it's little it's little tricks like that i mean donald pleasance in 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 deathline has it Mm. He, he just he's so playful um, within an atmosphere of, you know, it's utter horror and, and that's what works, you know, that's what works, that's what works in Halloween is when he drops in and, and, and all of that. I'll ask you one last question and then I'll let you go. Um, Do you have plans for Halloween? I do. I'm getting to talk about deadlines on Halloween. Um, if you are in London, um, I'm I'm giving a talk about the various different weird, wonderful, crazy places that all around London that have inspired filmmakers. And it's going to be at um, Kensington Library if, if anyone in London wants to go. Oh, actually, though, if you aren't in London, it's also going to be online. You can go on Eventbrite. And if you look up me or my book, I'm sure it'll be on there and it's free. So if you if you have nothing better to do on Halloween and aren't watching amazing movies, you can listen to me talk about horror movies all over London. It's been Thank fun. you. That was an unexpected, brilliant hook. I'm glad you made the pitch. I was going to ask you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, it, it's, it's really great to talk to you and, and to see you and um, I'm absolutely uh, 
more than happy to to promote your book and, and I wish you so much success with, with it. Thank you so much. It's been a great joy chatting with you. And I really, if you come to London, let me know. I'll take you on tour and, and at the very least for a pint. It sounds perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Hey, take care you. and have a great day. Thanks, you too. Bye. For links to Lauren's book or for all other information, please visit the website theresalore.com, T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E point com. That's all for today. This has been Who Killed Teresa. I'm your host, John Allure. Have yourselves a great, great day.